Actor, mm -hmm. Paul Germain. <laughs> for inviting me down in our conversations here in the last while with the Hall of Fame and some other matters. He was asked me to come down and uh, said I'd have about five minutes to talk to everybody. So I was thinking, well, what should I say? Five minutes is pretty hard to cover 60-some years. But uh, a lot of you know me. Uh, we've seen one another going back to the MMC days and even prior to that. And um, you see people and you wonder what they're about. So. I'm going to do a quick run through, start back at the beginning and kind of where I came from, what it was about, and why I'm still in it. The business was one aspect, make no mistakes, I love motorcycles, and that's why I'm here. All started, born in St. Boniface, grew up on uh, Jeanne d'Arc, which is the second street behind the park in English, that's uh, lights out in men's room, and then the, the forward <laughs> street. Facing the park was uh, that little story there. Grew up with the likes of the Sabarins and Nadox, Berards, few generations of them. So there was a lot of motorcycling going on. There was a lot of motorcycling going on in St. Boniface. And a little badge of honor of sorts on each end of the lad, there was a sign which was put up by the city of St. Boniface at the time, a bylaw that motorcycles were not allowed on this street. <laughs> you had to shut it off and push it down the street because the neighbors had all complained for a two block radius that motorcyclists were trouble and they made noise and stuff. So that was a badge of honor. And I always had the thought that I should steal the sign. It was just a small sign about this big and keep it, but I never did it. But it did exist and if you talk to the right people they'll tell you about it. So. At a, at a very young age, uh, I was exposed to it all, and I think my first ride was when I was about 12 years old, and got more involved with it at about 14, and at 16, of course, uh, I owned a motorcycle. And uh, my first motorcycle was a 250 Ducati, and uh, we had about eight guys all the same age lived on, on my street in particular, and uh, the first deal was uh, we had 100 cadets and then sort of graduated to the 250s and that kind of thing. That was approximately 1965. So, um, fast forward, kept going to uh, Chariot Cycle, who was the Norton Ducati dealer at the time on Selkirk Avenue, and was in there constantly getting parts and stuff because I seemed to be the mechanic of the group at the time. So I'd be fixing everybody's bikes, I'd go down and get parts, and one day in 1967, uh, the fellow at the time, uh, Wellums was his name at, in parts, he uh, said, you know, you're here so often, you should, uh, you should come and work here. And I was like, really? <laughs> That's, that was a heck of a deal at the time, so bang, I was there. So I came out of high school, uh, sort of, and <laughs> that wasn't my strong suit. But, uh, There's a couple sort of in this room. Yeah, we had a, took a few breaks from that, but came back to it. And, and anyways, uh, uh, like I like to tell everybody, I went to the U of M. I drove around the campus once. <laughs> and, at any rate, uh, uh, started at Chariot Cycle, and uh, about the same time, met a couple fellas, befriended a couple of fellas because we did a lot of road riding. We'd go out wherever on the weekend, <coughs> drive out to uh, go to Clear Lake, uh, the White Shell, whatever. Ended up meeting these two fellas and it was a hot July day as I recall and they were wearing these big leather fur caps and stuff and it was like about a hundred above and they were all, and they, and they were riding two R27 BMWs, never seen one. There wasn't any in Winnipeg. And uh, got talking to him, a couple draft dodgers from uh, the Chicago area. And their whole family was living in Transcona. Befriended them. <clears throat> and they, had, uh, they were very keen and up on motorcycling in general. They, had, uh, they, they would attend uh, Santa Fe Short Track in Hinsdale, which is like a suburb of uh, Chicago. So they knew uh, Bart Markle, Dick Mann, and all the names of the racers. They knew what they rode. They'd <laughs> seen them ride. Uh, and they also knew about the Manto Motorcycle Club, which I was kind of like, yeah, it's out there, but didn't know much about it. So 
started attending the meetings, and that must have been around 1967, and got more and more active with it, uh, and got, uh, I guess, to a point in 1969 where I became the uh, competition chairman. At the time, we had a, a, a balanced uh, schedule, so to speak. We had three hill climbs, three dirt tracks, three scrambles, three road runs. I think I think that's right, Ray? And something like that. And uh, everything was balanced out, and I and I got on to the the competition thing, and um, I was attending events prior to that and competing at the uh, insistence of my uh, U.S. friends that thought I should race, and uh, got the bug, and that's how it kind of all started. So, uh, trying to push the thing further than it kind of had been because it was very casual at the MMC and trying to organize it more and get recognition, uh, again, trying to elevate the whole thing with Manitoba, and uh, looked real hard at trying to get a, a CMA affiliate deal going there, but that just wasn't going to work within the MMC. <coughs> and although I didn't particularly take it to that next level at that point, I was getting more and more involved with the racing. There's other people that were in the club, like Bob Sutherland, uh, Bob St. Goddard and such, and, and they splintered off and started the CMA <coughs> club. So that's how that came about. That was about 1972, I believe. So meanwhile, 69-70, uh, I, I won the uh, MMC. Still got it. You're talking about trophies. Got this big trophy, the uh, competition champion for, it was a, a Cumulative points for the, all the disciplines is how it happened at the time. So, I won. I won that a couple years in a row there, and then the CMA took over, and then MMC continued on more as a as a club road riding club. And Agassiz Racing, as it became known, uh, became a competition club with uh, you know CMA recognition and, and the like. So, um, at that point, I had developed a. Uh, I worked at chair for a couple of years, and uh, I was winning a lot of races. I'd, I'd go to Sturgis in the summer and sort of bone up on what was going on there with the AMA guys and people like Neil Keane and uh, whoever would show up there. And uh, got to know Neil Keane and uh, convinced me I needed a Trackmaster BSA 65 in 1970. So I uh, came home and saved up my money and bought a frame over the winter. and. Mm race that for a couple of years, but uh, right at the time there was uh, Northwest Cycle got uh, bought out from the Perkins family in um, 1968 by two uh, individuals, uh, Eric Clark and uh, Bill Watts, not the same Bill Watts as here at the last meeting, <laughs> but uh, they purchased it and they immediately proceeded to uh, form a race team, because about late 60s, racing was a big thing about motorcycling, <coughs> you know, win a race on Sunday, buy one on Monday, whatever, I don't know if that ever happened, but that's kind of what was going on. Mm. I didn't have an affiliation with them, they were Yamaha Triumph, and uh, I was still running a 250 <coughs> body in my BSA, and um, somehow I was getting, I was beating up on them, and Eric Clark would come to me at the races and say, you know, I got six guys here on all kinds of bikes, and you come here and you and you beat us. And I'm sort of looking, at him, yeah. Well, why don't you put me on one of your bikes? You know. So that's basically what happened. And uh, they sponsored me on because uh, right at that point, uh, with the BSA Triumph deal amalgamating, uh, they became a BSA dealer as well as a Triumph dealer. So I said. I made a proposition to Eric one day at Morse, and I said, "Listen, Eric, I'll I'll put Northwest on. I'll you can sponsor me. You give me a Yamaha 250, and I will uh, I'll ride that in in the smaller classes and uh, motocross and so forth." So he said, oh, "Yeah, we could probably do that." So we did that, and in the course of that year, uh, he introduced me to uh, because uh, probably unknown to many, but. At the time, um, Dealey's was Yamaha in Canada until 1973, 1974, Yamaha uh, Japan bought out Dealey's and became Yamaha Motor Canada. Well, in 19, till 1974, uh, Northwest Cycling Winnipeg was a sub-distributor for Dealey's 
for the prairies for Yamaha. So they had a budget every year for racing, so they had they raced snowmobiles, motorcycles, and so forth. So that's kind of where I fell into under that umbrella. About the same time, another very famous Canadian, Yvonne Dohamel, uh, raced for Dealey's, and of course won Daytona in the 250 set fast time in 69 or whatever on a 350 Yamaha, 151 miles an hour, which was way faster than anything at the time, even the Harleys that were dominating and so forth. But uh, the fellow that was behind that at Dealey's, his name was Bob Work. And I was introduced to Bob Work through Northwest, and he immediately seen what I was doing, and I guess he saw something there. And they, uh, they assisted me even further in giving me special equipment and such for a few years. In the uh, fall of 1972, pretty well riding a high, and went down, they had a Can-Am thing uh, with uh, indoor short tracks at some of these horse arenas, and won a couple of them Sunday afternoon in Crookston, uh, while leading the race, I got run into from the back and broke my leg. Kind of a funny thing, but so I was kind of shelved for a little while, and I uh, a succession of things occurred within a 12-month period that basically shelved me. And uh, I uh, re-broke that leg in May of the following year at uh, an MMC race at Morris. I uh, broke my back at Bolsinger at a snowmobile race, and I. Uh, incurred some uh, head injuries at, a, at another event. So that uh, this all happened in a very short period of time, and basically by the time uh, 1973 came along, I was uh, I never rode. And I had uh, a couple very neat bikes that, uh, uh, with Yamaha's assist, or Dealey's assistance, uh, I had a 250 uh, TD2 dirt tracker, which is a very rare bike, and um, I uh, got a good friend of mine from Fargo, ride my motorcycles that summer and I drove around my van and we went to races in the US and stuff and that was basically how I made a living. Backing up to uh, 1967 and getting out of school, I was basically a mechanic in motorcycle shops and I worked at, uh, worked at Chariot to start, EK Cycle at some point, uh, Northwest at some <coughs> point, um, Gateway Cycle, B and B Mini Motors, and then in 75, I went on my own out of my father's backyard in St. Vital, which again was, at the time it was always seasonal, and uh, September had come and fall had come and you were basically unemployed. And the next spring it was kind of a, a sweepstakes to see who would end up where and all the, the better techs that end up at the better shops. It wasn't much training at the time, it was, uh, it was all by experiment. <laughs> hate to say that <laughs> on customers' bikes, but uh, that's the way it was. <laughs> and I got to tell you, it's a lot different today at great expense. <laughs> at any rate, uh, brings us to uh, the early 70s and came back in 74 uh, again with assistance from Northwest Cycle and, and by then Yamaha Canada and uh, ended up uh, runner up in 74. 475 and 750 dirt track. I had to abandon uh, what was becoming motocross after the 73 season because of my leg injuries. I just I just couldn't take the beating anymore, and uh, <coughs> so I, I uh, quit motocrossing. And um, in 73, 74, let's say I was runner up in 750, and in 75 I won the, the Canadian Championship in uh, 360. Um, right around that time. The Harleys and dirt track were really taken off, and the Yamahas were at a, just a, a, a disadvantage. To, we didn't have the power and the type of power necessary, so uh, the whole thing was kind of coming undone. Uh, Bob Work, that was with uh, with Dealey's and now with Yamaha Canada, took off to Europe with Stevie Baker. And he became a world champ, and uh, he left uh, the place in charge of another fellow by the name of Kenny Molino, who was instrumental in getting instrumental kind of talked me into going snowmobile racing with them which I did in the late 70s very successfully and won uh, some USSA championships and that and local basically dominated for two years locally with with that so the racing thing was always there and it was always happening and that's really what I, I lived for about 1968 69 where from the time I was in, you know, teens and through, and I rode the road a lot, like I was on the street every day, 
down at Burt's where everybody hung out. That was the deal. Uh, I sort of refocused my attention almost entirely <coughs> to competition and racing and such. And then by the early 70s, uh, didn't hardly ride the road at all other than during work hours and such, uh, you know, test riding motorcycles and such. Didn't, didn't have a road bike, didn't really want one. Also, never had a, <clears throat> never had a driver's license for a car until I turned 19. Never wanted one, didn't want one, didn't need one. Motorcycles are fine. Take the bus in the winter. That's okay. Motorcycles are where it was at. So, uh, yeah, I had, a, I had a devotion and love for it and uh, to this day. So uh, fast forward, 75, uh, started on my own. Again, went through the uh, late 70s. Uh, snowmobile racing in the winter was basically my income, and there was some money there to be made. And summertime, uh, worked out of my father's backyard, which grew into a, uh, grew out of the backyard. And to the uh, neighbors' uh, dismay, they were happy to get rid of me when I finally moved out of there in uh, 79 to a, a commercial location on. Um, Aaron Street and uh, was there for a couple of years and through my relationship with Yamaha of course I always knew everybody that was there fairly well uh, they approached me in uh, the winter of 1980 to uh, start Wildwood Sports at its present location so that's kind of the history of what happened there uh, as the racing tailed off and the Yamaha thing uh, grew tougher in uh, my necessity to injuries and such uh, to get away from it for a while. Uh, is when I started Wildwood Sports, I basically hung it up, and that was it for, uh, for racing for uh, eight years. And in 1988, I was talked into going snowmobile racing again by one of my employees, and uh, I don't think that was a good idea, but <laughs> <laughs> I beat myself up for a couple of years to figure out that uh, that time had passed. It was better to get some young guy to ride the machine. I could build a machine, but it wasn't a good idea for me to be on it. So um, that brought us to the late 80s. And again, so I was kind of semi-retired. From the time I quit dirt tracking, there's another little part of the story that a few people know and some that would be enthusiasts might know, but uh, I went car racing, sprint car racing. And I uh, drove for... Uh, Kenny Martin, who himself was a sprint car racer uh, going back to the uh, Brooklyn Speedway days, mm -hmm. and uh, he had a car, he was seriously injured, I think at the first year they ran Winnipeg Speedway, and uh, his mechanic, who was uh, another fellow that I worked with, sort of somehow influenced him in talking to me to go drive this car. So I, I drove this, uh, at the time it was a CKND TV 912 car. I drove it for three years. So, and after three years, I just chose not to do it anymore because it would, just wasn't what I really enjoyed. And uh, I was too busy with the business. Time had passed for that. Fast forward, 88, went snowmobile racing for a couple of years, hurt myself a couple of times, decided uh, that wasn't so good. Uh, meanwhile, on the business side, in 1988, we added BMW. Um, the uh, the entire motorcycle industry had gone into a slump. Things were getting pretty quiet. Business had dropped considerably. Uh, the snowmobiles with the brand we were carrying, Yamaha at the time, uh, wasn't happening real well, so there was a need to, uh, to expand the business to keep people walking in the door. And uh, there was a need to people such as yourselves and, and people coming to me all the time, Paul, why don't you do BMW? We need a BMW dealer in Winnipeg. And, uh, Strangely enough, the fella uh, that ran BMW in Canada, uh, Tony uh, Fletcher, was a ex dealy employee with Yamaha, so I knew him, sent him off a letter, phone call, and it's pretty well that easy. It, we all of a sudden were a <coughs> dealer at some expense, but and a great amount of training and hoops to jump through, but uh, we became a, uh, a BM dealer. So the business, uh, the motorcycle industry started to uh, rebound right, at, right, at, right in the late 80s, early 90s. To give you an idea what happened there, because a lot of people don't know this stuff, the uh, motorcycle industry uh, topped out in 19, I think 1983 or 84, give or take a year or two, at 140,000 units. By 1999, and they're not sure, because of exports at the time, uh, many motorcycles, Canadian used motorcycles are being sold into Europe. 
it uh, bottomed out at 20,000 units. So it, that was a significant drop in the industry and business. And I think we went from uh, uh, 16 franchised motorcycle dealerships <coughs> in Winnipeg in, uh, at the height in 1984 to three in, 19, uh, in 1999, which is not unlike similar to what's occurring this day. Really everybody knows kind of where, where it's at right now in Winnipeg. There's only uh, three actual franchise motorcycle dealerships as of today as, and one outside of Winnipeg proper. So uh, it's, it's, it's had its major ups and downs. Uh, an opportunity came up uh, right about that point in 1990 to uh, to also uh, boy up the sales and stuff and go into Polaris because they were happening and we were in the snowmobile business so we may as well have something that sold so I took on Polaris and we had Polaris till uh, 2005 I believe it was 2005 and within the same year again uh, an opportunity arose for Kawasaki and uh, I jumped on it because at the time Kawasaki was doing very well and uh, we had a lot of stuff in a small building but mm -hmm. it all worked and the market was much smaller so it, it all fit in and it, it all worked very well uh, for a period of time and as, as time changes and the logistics of it change for the different manufacturers and where they're going what they want to do uh, they, they, they can push you in and out pretty easily. So it's not as easy as people think that, oh, well, look at them, they got everything, you know, they got, they got, a, they, they got it made. It's, it's, it's very expensive to have what we have today right now. Uh, I can tell you to, uh, to enter into uh, agreements with either Triumph or Ducati specifically is a very demanding, costly process that uh, uh, takes a lot to, to keep the balls all in the air to make it happen. So it, it's not easy. It's not a it's not a license to print money. And then going back to the tech thing, I spend a lot of money on techs, and that doesn't mean they always work out. So I'm the captain of the ship, so sometimes uh, <laughs> it's directed to me, and I can appreciate that. Uh, I think everyone has to appreciate. I'm not always the one working on absolutely everything all day, every day. In, in the in the context of it, but anyways, that's just a little side note on the, on the business aspect of it, and uh, brings us up to today. In 1998, I went to uh, not having done anything for a while other than snowmobile racing, got into like a higher level of professional snowmobile racing, which uh, which was fine, but that's what it was. It was professional racing, and it, and it was costly, and there was money out there to do it with, and then it, that took another dive and uh, got out of that and oval snowmobile racing specifically. And I um, was looking for something that was a little more fulfilling than putting a lot of time and effort into <coughs> machinery for other people to ride and that kind of thing. And uh, ended up at Daytona meeting an actual Winnipeg that started actually a little bit of history there that started the MRA. It was uh, Kemp Archibald. And i have been reading about him in Cycle News over the years and how he was doing. And, uh, Went to Daytona, and sure enough, there he was, just uh, in living color. And I started talking to him, and he was riding a little 250 Ducati. And I said, I got one of these. And he said, well, you should make the road racer out of it and come out here and play with us. So I went home, and I did that. And uh, two years later, I got into Arma Racing and uh, just caught the bug. And Arma being, for those that don't know, the American Historical Racing Motorcycle Association, which in the 90s grew to be a a giant entity in the U.S. got to be bigger than AMA and uh, their events are even presently some of the biggest, right now I think some of the biggest events in the United States are, are Arma. Barber specifically in October is uh, this year I think they topped 78,000 on uh, you know on the weekend and uh, it's a gigantic event and uh, uh, 600 entries or something like that in uh, in. 70 some thousand people so it became a, a, a very big thing I like to think I was a little part of it I ran in 250 uh, the GP classes because of the uh, reference back to the uh, 50s and 60s in Europe FIM races the strength of their uh, organization was the GP classes 200 250 <coughs> 350 and 500 premier which was 
uh, like Manxes and G50s and, and such. And um, took an immediate shine to it and uh, built myself a 250. And in 2004, after many road miles, I won my first Armand National Championship. I brought a picture here. I didn't bring too much, but this is a, a picture of the bike, and that's that's the one that I, I won my first Arma championship. Since uh, 2004, I've won, I've now won nine championships. Uh, the most, the latest this year, on a middleweight, a vintage middleweight superbike, which is a. Uh, uh, again, they've got a lot of probably too many classes and too complicated <coughs> for the average person to understand. But you've got to look at a rule book and figure all these things out and stuff. But uh, a couple of years ago, I wanted to change things up because I ran Ducatis from. Uh, 2000 to 2005 and found myself uh, building some very special stuff, very special engines, but very fragile and didn't last very long, broke, uh, and I rode the heck out of them and broke them a lot, and didn't have enough hours in a day to keep everything running, even with a one month lapse between races, you find yourself building a whole new motor, it was uh, very time consuming and costly. So. Uh, went back to my roots with Yamaha and found a bit of a loophole in the 250, uh, in the 250 class to run a 252 stroke uh, piston port. So a 1968 just sort of fits in there a DT1 in a, in a, like an RD frame, which, which, which was, if you go back to the lineage and the ancestry of it, was like a TD frame or a factory road racer. So, it had all the makings of a good bike, and it ended up being a good bike, and I've won since then five national championships, almost six this year. I missed it by a little, but uh, we were second by a little. And built a um, um, middleweight superbike in uh, two years ago, and won that last year, first year out, and won it again this year. And um, just having a lot of fun doing it.